come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Kindly bow your heads with me. Dear God of heaven, we are so thankful that you were already here when we showed up. May your spirit speak to our hearts and our minds today through a song, through scripture, and through word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church family. How are you? I hope you all had a great week. It's great to see your smiling faces. We conquered another week by God's grace, and you're here today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get into today's um, divine service. The first thing being, um, sincere thanks to Brother Ben Coriet and our media team for the huge progress made with our online access. So shout out to our media team. Um, they would like to thank the church, and as shared on our WhatsApp uh, church bulletin, the links are now available for our YouTube playlist from our recorded services from 2022, 2023, and 2024. So please enjoy that. Go back, watch everything, um, and go back and watch all of those in your free time or today when you get home after this service, and then you can always rewatch this service. So you have a lot of services to catch up on. Amen? So thank you, media team, for all of that. And thank you, Brother Ben Coria. They would like to say thank you. And also, Sister Webb um, cordially invites her church family to celebrate and praise God with her as she celebrates her 90th birthday. So please uh, plan to enjoy lunch and Thanksgiving in the Fellowship Hall after divine service on Sabbath, September 28th. So remember, Sabbath 28th, um, we're celebrating Sister Webb and her 90th birthday. So if you'd like to come and support in the Fellowship Hall, um, they will have lunch prepared. And also exciting news, um, thanks to Brother Tubo, we, gain, we will again be having a special day of worship with Visiting Church on October 12th. So stay tuned for that. On October 12th, we'll have a visit in church, come for a day of worship. So please mark your calendars for that as well. And a special thank you for your continued prayers and your support for our pastor and our other members facing medical challenges. Lift them up in prayer. Um, we have a great physician, so please make sure that you are lifting our members up, your pastor up, your pastor's family, um, our first lady in in prayer, they are needing it. As you know, our pastor went through a procedure, and he is in the recovery process. He's in the rehab process. So please make sure that you are keeping him in prayer. And also, Vespers Night uh, is September 20th. Um, it's been successful, and we would still like for our members to come out for that. It's episode three. It's Friday, September 20th, so mark your calendar. Come as you are, and it's every third Friday. The topic is premarital sex, forgiving self, and knowing God doesn't hate you. So please make sure you're here. They'll have live music. They'll have open mic. They'll have snacks, and they'll have a children's corner. So please make sure you're here for that September 20th. And also, I have a 
letter here, um, an invitation, I should say, and it states from the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church, it says, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are delighted to extend a heartfelt invitation to your deacons, deaconesses, congregation members, family, and friends to join us for our annual Deacon and Deaconess Day on September 28th at Emmanuel SCA Church, beginning at 10 a.m. Deacon and Deaconess Day is a time to honor tra honored tradition in our church, dedicated to recognizing and celebrating the invaluable contributions of our deacons and deaconesses. These faithful servants play a crucial role in our ministry, providing spiritual support, guidance, service to our con congregation and community. The day's program will include a worship service featuring an insp inspiring sermon, special music, and a time of prayer and recognition for our deacons and deaconesses. A fellowship meal will follow along with us to share in the fellowship hall and unity before Bible study and AYM. Thank you for considering our invitation. We believe that your presence will greatly enhance the spirit of the occasion and we look forward to celebrating together in the spirit of unity and thanksgiving. We eagerly anticipate your participation in this celebration and pray for God's continued blessing on your ministry. So please, that is from the Emmanuel SCA Church. It's literally down the street from us. There are church family. There are church neighbors. Um, so September 28th, if you're interested in going, they are inviting the church. They're inviting deacons, deaconesses to participate and to be honored. Um, at their church. So please, if you are interested, it will be Emmanuel SCA Church, where the pastor, Dr. Dolphy Cross, is there. So please, if you are interested, our deacons and deaconesses, this is a time for you to go and feel honored there. So please uh, make sure September 28th, mark your calendar. You got a lot to mark your calendar for. It's a lot going on. Okay? Other than that, I believe that is it. Continue to keep your church in prayer and your pastor, and have a wonderful Sabbath day. Feel the spirit today. Enjoy what God has done for you this week. It's been a hard week for some. It's been a great week for others, but we're still here today. You woke up this morning, you're breathing, and we thank God for that. Have a beautiful Sabbath day. Happy Sabbath, church. Now, I don't know about you, but for some reason, whenever Sister Abby does the announcements, I just smile. She says it with such enthusiasm, a smile on her face, and it's just always warm. So I just want to tell you, whenever you do the announcement, Sister Abby, there's always a smile on my face. <laughs> now, with that said, I am here to give today's welcome, and I am extra, extra happy because guess what, people? We have more than five visitors today, okay? All right? So I want to say the biggest welcome to Solid Rock Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? As you walk through the doors today, whether you are a regular member or a visitor, I was so happy to see you. So as you enjoy today's service, may the Lord bring peace or whatever it is that you need the Lord to do for you today, okay? So welcome, welcome. But I just want to shout out our visitors today, okay? If you had written your name down, I will call your name. And if not, um, and I missed your name, then I'll ask you to stand, okay? So the first person we have today is Sister Paulette Kerr. Sister Paulette, you want to wave or stand for us? Welcome, welcome. Where are you visiting from? You live here? <laughs> Uh, well, welcome to Solid Rock. All right. Next up, we have Brother Mento. No, this is Brother Mento's second week here with us at Solid Rock. He came last week, right? He said he's recently moved here to the Orlando area. He's looking for a church, and he came to Solid Rock, and we are so happy to have you, okay? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And then we have the Shawwell family. So we have Sister Rosalind. Sister Brianna, we have Adrian, and then we have Brother Dexter and Lorena. Welcome. Well, listen, I, I am so happy to see you and have you here today. Now, do we have any other visitors that I missed? No? 
No other visitors? Okay. I see we have two young men in the back. I've never met them before. See, sister, you are a sister now. You can't even leave anymore, <laughs> okay? It's been more than three weeks that I've seen you, sister, okay? So now you're an official member. You can't leave. All right. <laughs> yeah, I saw someone in the back. Which back? Ooh, with the baby. Who's that? Would you mind stating your name for us? You first here? Ooh. Do you mind tell us what your name is? Kalita? Kalita. Kalita. Well, sister, you're an Adventist too? Ooh. So listen, we have sister Kalita in the back who is an Adventist, so we want to give the warmest welcome to her, okay? Now, we have not done this in a while, so I want to sing this little song, okay? Don't listen to the voice, okay? I'm not the bestest of singer. But we want to, if you can, go around and greet our visitors today, okay? So, let us greet somebody in Jesus' name. Let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Smile, everybody smile, everybody smile, everybody smile. Smile, everybody smile, everybody smile, everybody smile. Let us breathe. Somebody in Jesus' name, let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Smile. smile, everybody smile, let us greet somebody in Jesus' name, let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name, tell them we can work together in Jesus' name, everybody smile, Jesus loves you, everybody smile. Thank you and welcome to Solid Rock. All right, it's now time for the opening song, and uh, we'd just like to hear you stand with us at this time and sing with all that you have as we give praises to the Lord in song. Number 590, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His world, Trust and obey. Not 
Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but a toil He does richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but it's blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows, and the joy He bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says we will go, by the fear only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no To trust and obey. Amen. Be seated, please. Morning, church family. Aren't we happy and grateful to be in church today? Oh, yes. No, this is a time when every one of us can partake in the service of the day. Now we are going to give back to the Lord what belongs to Him. All right. The deacons will now wait upon us for the morning's tides and offering. Oh, yes. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. See that you excel in this grace of giving, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, 
through his poverty might become rich. If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. All right, let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us another privilege, another opportunity to come to your house to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, that you have provided for us. You have given us health and strength in our bodies so we can go to work to earn and to give you back which is that which is rightfully yours. Thank you for your mercy and your grace towards your children. As we worship, help us to worship in such a way which will be acceptable in your sight. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for providing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and happy Sabbath. Now, I know most of my little audience will not understand much, but I know there's something in common. Each of my little audience have a daddy. And the story I want to share with you this morning is the night daddy did not come home. Now, as I said, most of you children, you have your daddy. But dad, he used to go from time to time, dad would leave home. And if dad wasn't going to come home, dad would indicate to mother that tonight I will not be home. I'll be home tomorrow, or depends on the time. He would give a time when he would come home. But this particular day, dad leaves home with the intention to come back home. And for some reason, dad did not make it home that night. Well, if you go back in time, those were the days when there was not much transportation to come home. So in the evening, you have three bus that would pass by. One would pass by about 6 o'clock. The other one would pass about 7 o'clock. And the last bus would pass by at 9 o'clock. Well, mother sent the children at every time to walk back with dad home. But at each bus coming, Dad did not come on either of the bus. And now the last bus has passed, and Dad did not make it on one of those bus. So Mother, with her curiosity, and whatever is going on in Mom's mind, well, did you sure the last bus passed? Yes, Mother. The la well, go and make sure, just in case you miss the last bus, Go and see that the last bus did not pass. And we are mother, the bus as, well, you did not, did you see the bus? Did you hear the bus? Yes, mother, we see the bus. We, well, go back and look and see and make sure the last bus passed. Mother, the last bus passed. Well, mother was not satisfied with that. Well, go by Mr. Murray. And see if Mr. Murray hear from dad. Mr. Murray lived five miles away from her. But mother wants us to go and check, make sure Mr. Murray didn't hear anything from dad. Mother, it's too far to walk. By the time we get there, it will be, well, you make sure you go and hear something. Because it's not like that to come home. Mother, it's too much. Well, every cock crow, mother would say, go look and see. Every dog bark, mother would say, go look and see. And when that, mother say, you all come out of the house now. Because that is somewhere on the road you, and all night, nobody could sleep because dad did not come home. And so, thank God for morning. Early morning, about 7.30, Dad showed up on his way home. Because we were all on the road watching, looking for every vehicle for Dad to come home. And thank God, Dad came home. We would we'd never understand what was going on in Mom's mind. But all that was going on in Mom's mind, we know. That it was not like dad not to come home and mom could not handle it. And that night, the seven children, we were from two years old to about 16 years old. None of us could sleep in peace because dad did not come home. I would like to pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for our, our people. Amen. Amen. All right. So I hope and pray you won't get that experience when dad don't come home. All right.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are in the presence of God, aren't we? I'm pretty sure because I have been experiencing the Holy Spirit working, and I'm pretty sure you are experiencing that likewise. Guess what? This is a time in our service when we are actually going to be talking to him. And I know we have been talking to him through songs and and through, uh, you know, discussions, through the giving. But guess what? We're going to literally talk to him and address him as Abba Father this morning. But before I intercede or talk to him on your behalf and on my behalf today, I'm going to use this time to actually ask you to share some testimonies. Let us know your requests that you have so that I can bring them to our Heavenly Father on your behalf. Just this morning, before you start uh, sharing your, your uh, thoughts with us, you know, I was reading Psalm 18, verse 2. And I know for those of you who follow the Bible app, you probably have seen the text. And I was like, wow. It says here, um, and I'm thinking that David is the one who wrote the psalm. The Lord is my rock. I want you to count how many things that um, this psalm is like God to. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And then in the next verse it says, therefore I will praise him forever. And I was like, wow, this God is this and much, our God is this and much more. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to share uh, your thoughts this morning in testimonies and in prayer requests. But a slowly has, um, but a slowly. Okay, right, go ahead, sister. I didn't see that you have your mic, sister Sam. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. I just want to share my testimony this morning. The song says, I must tell Jesus yes. all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. This week, two of my close relatives, very close, passed. The last news came on Thursday. I can only say, Jesus, take me. Take me. But as we travel this road, we have to realize that we have to go through some storms. We have to go through some fire. But just keep holding on. I'm not at home today, neither am I in my bed. I feel a little queasy, but God is taking me through. Yes. I look back, how he has been taking me and my family. From when I was a little child, my father died when I was only two. My mother taught me how to pray, and my grandmother, thank you, Jesus. Today, we, this morning I got up, it was um, cloudy outside. But I know God is going to give us good weather so we can go out. Elder Coombs is here, and we have a wonderful time prepared for this afternoon. We had, we had prepared lunch for just those who are going out, but God bless. And so I'm going to open it up to everyone. Just come on to the fellowship hall quickly. And I hope the Lord will speak in your heart so you could be a part of this movement. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing on me. Amen. Lord, for his mercies towards me, and, and I'm asking you all to pray. I'm thanking you for your prayers of uh, for the Turner family. And I'm asking you a special prayer for my mother who is in the hospital. And please pray for all the sick ones in this church. Pastor Dade and his wife. Thank you. Amen. Uh, 
I must testify this morning that I believe that God's word is profound. As he said, he will never leave us nor forsake us. And um, this week, Thursday night, while I was coming home from my from the nursing home, it was about um, it was about ten thirty in the night. And before I reached where I live, the house before I reached the house where I live, I saw a white car, and I was wearing a hat. Your cap. I was wearing a cap that you see me wear most of the time from the church. I don't know what that cap represents, but I know I was. I know we are living in a grand and half, grand and awful time. And so, as I reach the white car, I pass around the back of the car. There's a guy came out with, with his, you know, those guys that wear the mop head, you know, like a flat around their head. He came out of the car and he boxed the cap, the cap off of my head. I said, where did you get that cap from? I stand up and I say, how do you mean where I get that cap from? And he, he walked, I step off and he walked back up to me. I knew what I could do to that guy. But the grace of God is with me. Amen. I thank God that I'm not the person that I was. Because I could, I could harm that guy, but I step off and go and pick up the, ha- the cap about eight feet, more than, about ten feet from my where I stand. And I walk off and go to my house. Virgin, God is good. And I thank God for the person. I thank God for, for the grace and mercy that he gave me and the strength and the change that he has in my life. Because I know what I could do with that guy. But thank God that he saved my life and he changed my life. And I'm serving him, not anyone else. And I thought that that guy had more, uh, two more guys left was in the car. So it's three of them. But he came out from the back of the car and he attacked me like that. I thank God for that that I'm still alive and I'm in church today to worship and to serve. Ask me not, O James, let's say, I've been and he was baptized last week. I was also praying be on that job. So he direct my part. So I was still praying. I said, Lord, you know, I need to do something. And um, the Lord take me to a job that I become like a part of the family. So I'm thanking God for my son baptism and my new job. Amen. will bless the Lord. times his praise shall continually be in my mouth I would like to give God praise and thanks for the gift of life and for his preservation care for continuing to provide for me and for the household that I he has me being housed at and so I give him thanks that he is my Lord and my God, my rock in whom I can depend on. He is always there for me. And I ask that he would continue to keep me strong despite whatever is going on. The trials are there, but God continues to hold me with his unchanging hands. And I would just like to give him all the praise, the glory, and the thanks what he continues to do. 
Amen. 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 Um, I too want to give God thanks for life. I had an experience this morning. I was on my way to do Sabbath school, superintendent, coming out of Apopka. Those who know the Wawa that's closer, it's in Apopka, not the one that's close to Walmart, the other one going down on 441. I was at the light, waiting for the arrow light to turn on to 441, and the light changed. But Apopka is such that they don't give tickets anymore for red light. And as the light changed, I didn't move immediately, and I moved on my aura light. And brethren, I was almost halfway. And there I saw, it's like in my peripheral view, a thunder truck coming lightning speed and I slammed on my brake and God was so good the person behind me hit the brakes and that man passed I mean he was going probably 90 miles per hour he would have hit me way over yonder at the speed he was going he broke the red light and he was going at bird speed and I, I was there. The person behind me was frightened too. And I was just saying, Jesus, thank you. That's all I could. And all the way I was just saying, Lord, look at me. Dead this morning. But God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For that saving grace at that moment. Because all I could say was, Lord of mercy. Nothing else. That's all I could have said. And I want to just thank God and say hallelujah for his mercies that saved me this morning. Amen, amen. I invite you to kneel or just be in the act of worship, a prayer as I pray. <coughs> I'm going to ask Brother in the song it says, As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old day, and who shall wear the starry crown? Oh Lord, show me the way. Oh sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. And as I and as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Oh, Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. Our God, our Father, our Redeemer, our Rock, our shield, our defender, the horn of our salvation. We come bowing in your presence, giving you thanks for life, giving you thanks for your protection and your provision, giving you thanks for your interest in our salvation by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary's cross for our sins. This morning, we confess the sins that we have committed and pray that you remove them from us as we repent. Pray that the channel between us will be clear so that you can hear our prayers and you can answer them. Oh God, we pray like David that you'll create in us a clean heart and within us, renew within us a right spirit. We thank you, God, for always being there for us. And we thank you for the privilege that we have to come together as a church family to worship you. We thank you for what we have learned so far 
through the lesson study, through songs, through admonitions. We just give you thanks and praise. And we pray, God, that as we anticipate listening to Sister Winsome as she speaks to us, that our hearts will be blessed. I, we continue to pray, God, that your spirit will rest over her so that she will share with us your message today. And then, God, we come before you giving you thanks and praises for protection like you did um, for Sister Monica and many of us as we travel on the busy road during the past week. We thank you too, God, that despite the, the deaths that we have had in our families and, and, and friends and uh, who have died and, and, and close acquaintances, that you have been give, providing for us comfort. We thank you for your embrace. We thank you for your hug of love. And I pray, God, that we will not mourn like we have no idea what's going to, what, what plans you have. Because we do know that there's a great resurrection morning coming because Jesus Christ is alive. And the last enemy that will be defeated is death. So God, I pray that you will just keep us faithful and may we keep our focus on you. We thank you for birthdays that have been that will be celebrated this week. We thank you for Sister uh, uh, this coming uh, week or next week with Sister uh, Webb and also Sister uh, Tomlinson. We pray that you'll protect her as she goes on her grand vacation this week to celebrate her 85th birthday. And we pray that you'll be the plans for Sister Webb as she chooses to share her special day with us here at church on the 28th. We give you thanks and praise for that, Lord. We thank you so much also for your protection over Brother Slowly. Have no idea what the devil had his, in his mind for him, uh, Lord, but we do know that your angels surrounded him. And despite even this, the, the encounter, you kept him strong, you kept him tall, you kept him um, in his right mind. And thank you so much, Father, as he says, for changing his life and for also saving his life. We want to give you thanks, too, for um, being with um, Sister Turner Samuels and her family. And, and in a very special way, we ask that today that you surround Sister Turner's, Mother Turner's, uh, um, in her bed at this morning, the hospital bed, that your angels will also be around her. And may she reflect on the times and even now that you always have been there for her. We want to give you praise uh, for my sister who is thanking you for providing a new job for her and for also allowing her son um, to give his life to you. And I know, God, that many of us would want to stand up in church to give that testimony of children, wayward children, children who were once with you and have departed, would love to stand up and give in testimonies that they have given their lives back to you. So, Father, we are asking that your Holy Spirit will continue to do the job of reaching their hearts until they say, I yield, I yield to, I cannot hold it any longer. I need to come back to my God. Also, not just um, children, but our siblings likewise. Thank you, God, because you, are, you have not given up on any single one of us. You're always um, seeking to save those who are lost. Lord, we thank you, Father, for... Um, for always being there with us. Thank you so much for always telling us, uh, the, the, the drawing us closer to you. Thank you so much for healing. Thank you so much for restoration. In a very special way, we present our pastor before you. We pray, God, that you will continue to heal him so that he can be, be back with us as soon as possible. I pray that you will bless him and guide him. In a very special way, too, we want to pray for Sister DeGans, who is not here with us. I know she's with a group of like believers, and I pray that her first Sabbath day on this special uh, trip that she's on will be a, one, a high day in Zion for her. Uh, I also want to pray for the sick of our congregation, those who are homebound. You know them, Lord, and I pray that you will always be there for them. Thank you so much for what you're doing on their behalf. Lord, we cannot wait for Jesus to come to take us to heaven um, to be with you. And I pray, God, that you'll keep us faithful until then. Thank you for the privilege that we have to even learn about you as we, have, uh, as we are on this journey together. Thank you for your words. Thank you so much for giving us a wonderful church family here at Solid Rock. And this morning, we are here to listen to Sister Winsome as she speaks to us. 
may our hearts be, be kindled, may our minds be alert so that we can hear the message. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for the forgiveness of sins. And we now submit ourselves to be used by you always. Be with those who are going out this evening. Lord, on your behalf, I pray your spirit will go ahead and prepare souls um, that, that will be receptive to hear your words. We love you. We thank you. And we surrender our all to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for praise and worship. You know, when we think about then, the goodness of God and the way that he continues to bless us in so many different ways, all we can do is just give him the praise, elders, brothers and sisters. Because he is worthy of it all and so much more. We are here today simply because God has allowed it to be so. What he has for us to do, he will reveal to us individually as well as collectively. So, as we sing, we're going to be singing three songs to you today. We are going to be singing three songs together today. How cheering is the Christian hope? march into Zion, and I love to tell the story. So as we sing, let the messages that are contained within the words of the song just lift you up to heavenly places, because that is where Jesus dwells. So we will sing together. You got it, Elder? 440 is the first one. Let us sing. How cheering is the Christian's hope while toiling here below. It buoys us up, it buoys us up while passing through. This wilderness of hope, it buoys us up while passing through this wilderness of woe. It points us to a land of rest where sin with Christ will reign, where we shall meet, where we shall meet the loved of earth and never part again, when we shall meet the loved of earth and never part again. Fly lingering moments fly, oh fly, dear Savior, quickly come. We long to see, we long to see thee as thou art, and reach that blissful home. We long to see thee as thou art and reach that blissful home. 
to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his glory. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his love, I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, for wonderful it seems that all the golden. Of all the golden dreams, I love to tell the story. It did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story. and his love I love to 
out there. Well, you look good. Maybe we need to trade places. You come up here and I come down there. How about that? No? No takers? Oh, come on. Well, well, it is good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And I won't delay. Let's uh, bow your heads with me as we talk to God to begin this time of conversation. Mm. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to hear from you through your word. Teach us afresh to identify as your son and as your daughter as we hold to your truth. Lord, please remove all distractions that will prevent us from hearing from you. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, I pray. All right. Ooh, so this afternoon... Our, our focus is on two words, the truth, the truth. Hmm. So Jesus was faced with many questions during his earthly ministry, but there are two questions 
which were opposed to him. And I became curious. Are the individuals or individual seeking clarity, seeking truth? You will discover as we go through our time of conversation that we will look at what is truth. We will also look at what is the biblical evidence of truth. And we will look at the invitation to God's truth. See, growing up, being raised as an only child until I discovered I had siblings, because it was interesting. So there goes truth, right? So all my childhood, I was an only child until voila, I discovered siblings 20 years my senior. And for some of you, you, you are aware that last month I was in Jamaica for the funeralization of my brother. Hmm. And his name was Michael. Truth. What is truth? So this is a good place to start. Because I have found that all of us define truth differently. For each of us, truth means something different. Hmm. Truth means different things to different people based on one desired outcome. So if I intend to get a particular outcome, then my own philosophy of truth is skewed. According to Robert Sheldon, absolute truth is whatever is always valid, regardless of the parameters or context. The absolute in the term connotates one or more of a quality of truth that cannot be exceeded, complete truth, unwavering and permanent. But there is another truth I've discovered, and it is relative truth. Relative truth is conditional, subjective. It varies. It contradicts. So it is capable of changing over time. So I remember as a child, you know, I would do something. I won't tell you what the thing I did, but my dad called me. He always had these family meetings. We would, I would get creative. I'm going to use that word. I would get creative because I'm the only child in the house. And I was never bored. And so my dad would ask, so can you explain to me why you did X or Y? And trust me, I felt I was so equipped to defend my position because I had my version of truth. So what does absolute or relative truth look like? I want to present to us Exhibit A. Perhaps one of the most prominent Bible characters that exemplifies all absolute truth is Joseph, the son of Jacob, found in Genesis. Despite facing betrayal by his brothers, false accusations, and imprisonment, Joseph remained faithful to the tower of truth. His refusal to succumb to the temptations presented by Potiphar's wife showcases his unwavering integrity. Ultimately, Joseph's life is marked by forgiveness and reconciliation, highlighting the transformative power of maintaining truth to God even in adversity. This 
is absolute truth. The book of uh, of Job also introduces a man of great integrity in extreme suffering. Job described as blameless and upright undergoes immense trials, including losing his wealth, health, and family. But despite the overwhelming challenges, Job did not walk away from the truth he came to know of God, even when the situations changed around him. But it was very clear that persons close to him could no longer trust in the truth of Job's God because they saw firsthand and maybe secondhand the pain and the suffering Job was going through. And they chose to embrace relative truth. You see, the outcome wasn't what they desired. Relative truth, in this case, was saying to Job, curse God, because he is not the God that you think you know. And I, it had me ponder for my own self, have I found myself in a space where I'm leaning towards relative truth because what's before me is not what I desire. Job's steadfast, resilience, and unwavering faith during his his profound suffering exemplify the depth of his relationship with God, the God of truth. And we can find more to that story in Job 27. But I just want to read three verses. Verse 3, 4, and 5. And this is Job. As long as my breath is in me, and my breath of God, and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Let me read it again. As long as I have breath in me, and the breath is of God, and it's flowing through my nostrils. I cannot speak wickedness. My tongue can only testify of who God has been and will always be. Verse 5, far, far be it from me that I should say, you are right, till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Mm. So we have absolute truth, and we are seeing a glimpse of relative truth. And so 2024 has been an interesting year. And I was doing some research. I said, you know, there's something that's going to happen here in the U.S. that everybody is watching their television I won't tell you how many channels my husband watches to get different viewpoints. Drives me. Okay. So, but I was looking at this report from NPR, and this was a, um, the, I believe it was August 5th edition. And so this, I, what I will present is Exhibit E. According to NPR, and for those who don't know, I believe it's a national public radio. The global stage will have 17 major elections in 2024. So globally, there will be 17 major, not the minor ones, there are others, but the major ones that will impact countries, nations, and the world. And each political leader will emerge with their version of truth. Ah, here we go again. Which most often is relative truth. Hmm. 
as to why they ought to be the chosen leader. So can I tell you that 16 of those elections have already passed? 16. One is remaining. And of those 16, when I looked at what transpired around their electoral process, what happened after the vote was counted, I could not find a leader that exemplified absolute truth. Think about it. We had in January, and I'm not going to do all of them because we'll be here all day, but Bangladesh, it was so interesting that in Bangladesh in January, their election was, was, was filled with violence. And the government decided that they were going to crack down on their opponents. <laughs> and they used even AI to send out disinformation. And what is even more interesting, that after they did all of that, and the person who believed that they should be in power, went in power, but had to resign by August 5th. Had to resign. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Well, you may have heard about the elections of El Salvador. <laughs> he, this dude just got up and said, I have won by a landslide victory. It doesn't matter what the numbers say. We're not even going to count. I've already won by landslide victory. But it gets better. You had someone from Pakistan who, because of the corruption of how he previously led, was now in, in, uh, in jail. And even while he was in jail, he was campaigning. He was campaigning, and it, 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 it just baffles my mind that you will have individuals who have embraced not absolute truth, but even a mustard seed of truth that someone puts out there and they don't fact check them. The one that really uh, breaks my heart because um, sometimes we don't see the implications of the actions. And that one is Russia. So we have Vladimir Putin who is now in for another new term, six more years. And we say, according to his books, this election was fair and just, right? And all the while making war with his neighbors and justifying his actions. Then we have November the 5th that's coming up. And there are two signs. I am not going to tell you how to vote. I, if you choose that you don't think you should vote, that's your right. But I'm going to share a story. Because I, growing up, my, my parents always instilled in me that, that, that responsibility to be involved in the affairs of your country. And so as I was getting to the, uh, the age of 18, I was so excited because I could not wait to cast my first vote on the island of Jamaica. It was a Sabbath afternoon. We, we just came home from church. And there were two guys who approached the, the gate. And as you looked at them, you saw death. Nobody 
wanted to go out there. And so my little four feet plus mother-in-law went out. And I said, I'm afraid too, but I can't just let, let her go out there by herself. Michael didn't go out there. None of the men went out there. But anyway, that's another story. Maybe they were protecting themselves. I don't know. But I went out there, and what amazed me was that an electoral system that was supposed to be private, information that I gave as I decided to register to vote, that they had a book with every information about me and my mother-in-law and everybody in the house. From where I was born, my parents, I mean, every single, the only thing they did not have was, I think, my, um, what do we call that now? NIS number. And then they posed the question. And I'm going to try and do it in Patois. I'm not going to be very good. I mean, if Michael, you can help me. But he's, they said, we want, we, mm, we want to know what we to do for the election. Which means, I need to know where you plan on casting your vote. I already have your details. So I'm here today to find out where your allegiance is. And I am from this particular party. And you know, you know, the honest truth was, that was the party I was going to vote for. But when that happened, I said, no way. Not my vote. You won't intimidate me. You will not get the vote. Long story short, they eventually said they don't need our vote. They sent a message to the House. We have already voted for all the wings. They have already voted for all the wings. And so when we migrated to this amazing country, I remember saying to, to, to Michael, my husband, that I cannot wait for the opportunity to vote because I never had that opportunity. That was taken away from me. And now I look at this country and I wonder if sometimes if I'm back in Jamaica. The Bible is clear. And if we turn to John 3, 32, it says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There is no ambiguity about the truth from a biblical standpoint. It says, unlike what political parties or leaders have done over the years, or even present, we can find truth, absolute truth, in the word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. No one. Jesus is not just one of, Jesus is not just one of many paths to truth. He is the only path. He is the only path, and there we will find lasting truth. This means that when we put our trust in Jesus, we can know for sure that we are on the right path. We can be confident in what we believe. So exhibit C, we're going to look at scripture and see what it has to say. Truth number one, we can find in Psalm 119, verse 160. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Which means, he is not saying today I am all truth 
tomorrow I'm half truth, and the next day I'm thank you, thank you, truth. I'm absolute truth from day one and forever. This verse reminds us that God's word is the embodiment of truth. Every word and commandment from God is true and enduring. It is the foundation which we build our faith and navigate our lives. Truth number two. It says, all scripture is God breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not just every work, but every good work. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17. In this verse, we see that all scripture is divinely inspired and holds the value of absolute truth. The Bible is not just a collection of writings. It is the very breath of God. It guides, it equips us for life of righteousness and prepares us to do good work. You know, this week, um, our hospital was, I, I, I don't know if I should say we were on high alert, but we, for those who are in the healthcare industry, or you may know something about evaluations, if you have ever gone to school, taken a test, you know, there are checks and balances. How much, you know, what have you learned, okay? Um, if your vehicle has on a light, they go to an evaluation. What is wrong with it? Why the check engine light is on? Well, this week, for about three days, um, there were some who were highly anxious, and some just said it is what it is, because we had a regulatory body that was evaluating our processes as a health system. And so they were pulling everything. They're looking at patient records, HR records. They're looking at even the temperatures on the refrigerators, those logs, everything they're evaluating. And they had full access to the entire facility. For some, it was nerve-wracking. I had to say to my team, I said, please, when you see these evaluators coming towards you, don't just turn and run towards the elevator, or run down the stairs. At least say good morning, good afternoon, or something. Then you go about your way. <laughs> One was actually stopped and, and questioned. Um, but that went well. Mm. We are supposed to do good work every day. But it's not possible if I am doing it based on my set of truth principles, which can be tweaked based on what I want out of it. So truth number three. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. This verse highlights the liberating power of truth. It's not like God say, okay, this is true, and you read it, uh, you listen to it, you reflect on it, and it does nothing for you. It does something for us. When we embrace the truth found in Jesus, it break chains, the chains of sin, the chains of falsehood, and it sets us free to live in the fullness of God's grace and purpose. There is another truth that God wants us to know. I call it the fourth. But I think it's the ultimate truth. The truth is that God wants us, you and me, to inherit eternal life. 
So if we were to sit on the bank, you know that game on the river and the bank? If we were to sit on the sidelines and only embrace a measure of truth, then what he's offering us, we cannot attain. If we cannot attain. The sad truth of sin is that it only produces death. Sin produces death. We could slice it, dice it, however we want. It only produces death. And also, the sad truth is that the father of all lies is incapable of telling the truth. So if you go back to the Garden of Eden, we would say, oh, but he told, no, it was not absolute truth that he conveyed to Eve. He's not capable. He may trick us with versions or elements of truth, but it is not absolute truth. And because of his initial lie and continuous lies, we have a serious sin problem. So my first caution, don't look at anybody in here. It doesn't matter how nicely clad they are. It doesn't matter how eloquent they are. It doesn't matter how many degrees or letters they have behind their name. When you want truth, look to God. This sin problem prevents us, it prevents you and it prevents me from living a life of absolute truth. So we can hear from Paul where he proclaimed, and this is Paul speaking, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Mm, powerful, powerful. You know, we find this in 1 Timothy 1.12. What was happening in Paul's life when he wrote these words? If we were to go down to verse 8 of that same chapter, we will find it says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in a suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us a holy calling. So you see when uh, truth number four, where I'm saying that he's, he's extending an invitation for us to inherit eternal life, it is a calling. And we have an option to either accept or reject. Continuing in verse nine, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave in Christ Jesus before the ages, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. His appearing abolished And brought life and the hope of immortality to the gospel. That is huge. That is so huge. So on our spiritual journey, if we are truly leaning into who God is and his desires for us and his way of being, because he can only be truthful 100%, then there are some things we may need to check, and I may need to check. So a question is, what is preventing you from living out God's truth? Not the relative truth, not 10%, not 15 not 50 100% absolute truth. 
I want us to look as I'm preparing to bring this together at Luke 10, because that is our, that's where the meat of the matter is. Luke chapter 10. And we're going to start at verse 30 to 32. See, because the Bible is clear as to what is good and upright. There is no guessing. It is very clear. And it says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. You know, I was listening to the sharing of the testimonies earlier. And what I was seeing is that the same enemy that organized this beating that he wanted not only to rob but kill this person is the same one that shows up in our lives today. We talk about the attack, the assault on Brother Slowly. That was not God giving him a love pat. We heard from, 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 from Sister Samuels that within a week she had two additional deaths. God did not say when I created humanity, you are going to have a lifespan of X. It's like you, you go into the, 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 the lab and you decide to create this rope. Well, <laughs> talk about the robots, but if, if you buy, I'm trying to think of what is it that we bought, and within two years you just stop working. Appliances. It's almost like they are designed not to go beyond a certain period of time. Cell phone. So that same destructive element was one who organized the attack on this man. And 31 says, a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw him, he ran over to assist, correct? And I'm wondering, would I be running over to go at an assist? You know, because sometimes we can say, um, this area is not safe. It, it's not properly lit. Um, I don't like the attire of that person. I don't know if it's a setup. And then we, you know, we create these narratives as to whether we should deliver aid. But he passed by on the other side. And then the Levite came. And he too saw the man half dead, beaten, and he passed by on the other side. No one said, well, they didn't have cell phones, but no one said, let me call a neighbor. Let me tell, since I don't want to do it myself, let me tell somebody to go do something. These two men made the decision in accordance with the relative truth they have chosen to embrace, which seemed to somehow align not just with their own values, but that of the perpetrators, the persons who evicted violence on this lone man on the road. Because they did nothing. But I am thankful that today, you and I, can choose to find and surround ourselves with absolute truth, God's truth, 
and that will direct our path. If we are living in God's truth, there are certain evidences that we will see. You see, this passage reveals God's call to each of us, not just to the priest, not just to the Levi, but to each one of us. In this passage, we can clearly see a false representation of God because what these individuals represent. We also saw that one person, the Samaritan, emerged from the story as the unlikely hero. Because he, of all of the three individuals, was the unlikely one to render aid. The truth is, this unfortunate guy was beaten to a pulp and left for dead. And may I present to you that this man was not only broken in body, he was broken in mind, and he was broken in spirit. The truth is, each of us have been and will continue to be under attack by the enemy. But sometimes, do we actually realize the enemy is doing it? We just say, oh, it's just coincident. Oh, that just happened. Hmm. Jesus' invitation to be with him for eternity involves a lot more than just becoming a member of a community of faith. Just putting your name on the roll, going out there and doing acts of kindness, but yet you're not really aligned. Because the thing about it is, absolute truth does not just show up in one area of our lives. It's the entire composite of who we are. Jesus not just offers companionship and forgiveness, but the opportunity of a new identity to live a new life, to be with him for eternity to those who choose him. So if we were to go back you know, Jesus was asked a question by the skillful lawyer. And the question basically was, who knows that question? How can I inherit? What is that, Brother Mark? Eternal. Because he's just like myself when I was younger. I thought I could outsmart my dad. So, you know, I had classic responses. And he had a classic response. You know, he posed a question because he wanted a particular response so that he could then respond again. But you see, Jesus knew that he needed to get to the heart of this lawyer. If he had given him a different response, it would just have bounced off him. And the lawyer could have missed the opportunity to reflect on what he would what he would do based on his own personal truth value. So instead, Jesus tells the story. A story that allowed this lawyer to see himself not in the priest, not in the Levi, 
but in the person that was victimized. He was now forced to think, how would I want others to treat me? And it then propelled him to revisit his definition of love. You see, very often we use the word love, and when it's around February or wherever, you you feel a lot of love in the air. Something in the air. Not sure if it's love. Maybe money. But when there is true love, Sometimes you, you put yourself between situations as you are led by the Holy Spirit so that change, hope, and peace can be experienced by others. Just rethinking the definition of love, it shows that this lawyer needs to treat others in a consistent way, the way that God wants not only the lawyer to be treated, but others to be treated. So the whole point in verse 28, when it says, when when Jesus responded and say, love your neighbor as yourself, not just love your neighbor, but love your neighbor as yourself changes the whole premise of the story. Because we are not bystanders. It says, on one occasion, an expert stood up to test Jesus. So his question was not for self-learning. It was a trap. Going back to Luke 10, 25. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus responded, what is written in the law? It's a question. Because you're a learned person, you already know what is in the law. How do you read it? Another question. So today, I'm presenting these two questions to to us. And how are we seeing the written word And how are we choosing to read it? Verse 28 is, if if anything else just hit me, is that we can skirt around, we can justify, we can can come up with half-truths. But at the end of the day, verse 28 says, do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. So we can justify, well, it's too hot. I can't, I can't go out to do any distributions with Elder Coombs and the rest of the gang. Um, I, I, I can't visit the, the shut-ins. I mean, my life is full because I work 24 hours of the day. We can go on and on. I live too far. To, the commute is too much. But how are we demonstrating that we are living right now in anticipation of inheriting mm, eternal life? But you know, you think the lawyer would have quit. Mm -mm. Verse 29, he decided to come back. And who is my neighbor. Isn't it like us to pretend to be clueless? 
either we try to be clueless or we pretend that we are so learned that the person around us cannot understand what we are trying to communicate. The sad reality is that when we pretend to be clueless, even though the word of God remains clear, we have just given the enemy permission to savagely beat us spiritually and leave us for dead like the man on the road to Jericho. When we find ourselves, when I find myself in that place, it is my hope that we will all cry out to God and ask him to silence the noise that is causing us to be distracted and not hear and not comprehend his will for our lives. Our eyes of our hearts need to be opened. So that we can not only hear, but we can absorb the truth of God. A truth that is not dependent on the outcome, but dependent on the God who will be with us, irrespective of the outcome. The eyes of our hearts need to be open and accept absolutely absolute truth as it is in the Bible. And we need not go and say we have in Bible study to justify and challenge anything in the word of God. Because we are not God. Joseph and Job demonstrated absolute truth. Did the enemy come up against them? Yes. Yes. And yes, but their plumb line was anchored in God, in his word, in his equipping power, and in the freedom of bondage that they experienced as they chose to trust God. The question for us today is, which will we choose? What is convenient? Relative truth. So we can, you know, we had a a pastor a few years ago back in Georgia, and I remember we had a meeting, and our head elder said, you know, if he looks at me, in a different example, the elder was wearing orange socks. If he looks at me and say my socks are blue, then my socks are blue. No, we need to know what is truth. We need to know what is truth. So, I'm going to invite us to ponder this question. Am I allowing myself to be obedient? To the word of God. And therefore, I am aligning myself to his truth. And that I am choosing to put away my devious, hidden agendas for whatever reason. And choose absolute truth so as to inherit eternal life with God. Because there is a place where we will never, ever grow old. As the song is played, I invite you to meditate on the words of the song. And and of the invitation that God is extending to us. And he's saying, you're mine. 
I have done all that needs to be done to bring you back to me, to restore you so you can live with me for eternity. Have you heard of land? Is it a land where you want to go or do you want to stay here in Florida, Orlando, Solid Rock? Or you want to go into go to that land where you see your maker. And if you know it, sing along. Grow up. Aren't you tired of being tired? Mm. Our work will be done. If you know it, sing it. Never grow old. Never grow old. In the land where we'll never grow old. Never grow old. See, 1991, the first significant loss of my life was my father. Sometimes I don't think I've gotten over it. But what keeps me is that I want to be in that land where my dad will be joined when we have that resurrection morning. So I don't want to pretend that because I put on certain garb, that it means that I will be ushered into the kingdom of God. I have to recognize that the Bible and the Bible alone speaks to all absolute truth, the only truth that we need to govern, I need to govern my life by. Not what politicians are purporting, not what other scholars are saying, but I need to fall before God and be real. Because if I'm going to survive as long as I have so far on planet Earth, and when the roll is called, I am not ready. I pray you want to go to that place. I pray that when your work is done, that the place where God is inviting you and inviting me 
to be with him for eternity, that that is your home. But guess what? It will not happen. Because he has said, unless you love your neighbor as yourself. And in loving your neighbor as yourself, you're demonstrating your love also to God. So you know what? If there is anything that you know and I know that if God were to just open the clouds today that would prevent us from being with him for eternity, I invite us to give that to him. He has paid it all. So we can stand strong and finish well this race. But it means nothing if every day it is a pretense. It's a pretense to love the person a few pews away from you. The person on your job, the, your neighbors. We can't pretend love. So the invitation is ours. Choose life or choose death. Choose absolute truth or choose relative truth. True that is etched in the blood of Jesus Christ. Choose Jesus or choose the adversary. But you have to choose. I have to choose. Because there will come a day we will not gather like this. These four walls will not be our sanctuary. And we need to be able to hear God speaking to us, guiding us, delivering us. But unless we are tuned to him, it will not happen. So, I'm going to offer a prayer. And for the first verse of the song that will be done here by our praise uh, leaders. I want you to stay seated for the first verse and let those words of that song bathe over you. And then we will stand for the remainder of the verses. Let us pray. God, we need your Holy Spirit like never before to be victorious over our fleshly nature where we often are self-seeking. Today we are claiming to align ourselves with you the absolute truth. You don't mince words. You don't play around. You make it plain. And we have the choice. And the beautiful thing, you don't even force us. You're saying, here is the truth. I love you. I love my son to come and die. but it's still your choice. God, we are asking that you will inspire us to feast on your word because in it we will gain power, equipping power, that we will be freed from the bondage. We can feel those chains falling off. We can feel those heavy burdens just being shifted from our backs. 
And then ultimately, we have the assurance, because you're the guarantor, that we can have eternal life with you. Help us never to forget these these truths and to trust you just as Joseph did, just as Job did, and many others, so that our names will be written in the book of life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue to sing. I trust the ever living one that he for me will bleed. I need no other evidence. I need no other. That Jesus died and rose again for me. Shall we stand? Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He will not cast me out. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again. My soul is resting on the word, the living word of God. Salvation in my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. The great physician heals the sick. The sea came to save. Precious blood he gave, for me his life he gave. I need no other evidence, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. And rose again for me. Let us pray. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. Father, we ask that you will let your Holy Spirit reveal the truth to us. 
the absolute truth of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Lord, we pray for the forgiveness for our sins, where we, we have made all the truths our platform and foundation. Lord, we ask that you will remove them from our lives and that we will embrace you so that your will be fulfilled in our lives. I ask that you will be with us as we travel home at this time and that you will give us a Sabbath day blessing because we ask in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. You may be seated. You will be ushered out. And we just ask that the men of Solid Rock just meet on the organ side for a brief meeting. Thank you. And for those who are going to be going out on our missionary outreach, we lunch is provided for you in the Rose Center. Thank you. I believe it's, there is enough for everyone. At this time, we are just quickly inviting all the men, if you could just meet us uh, right here very quickly. I promise the meeting will not go more than probably 10 minutes or so. So all the men at this time, thank you so much. <laughs> 